If I could have everyone's attention, we're ready to start. If you could find your seats. So we are thrilled to have here today uh, Ethan Brown uh, to speak with us. Um, Ethan is the Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of Beyond Meat, a company focused on perfectly replacing animal protein with plant protein. Ethan gained a profound appreciation from the natural world from his father, a professor and conservationist. Ethan's passion for the environment has shaped the direction of his adult life. After earning an MBA from Columbia University and a Master's of Public Policy from the University of Maryland, he embarked on a career in clean energy, spending eight years at Ball Ballard Power Systems, the world's leading proton exchange membrane fuel cell company that offers smarter solutions for a clean energy future. Although he enjoyed a su successful career in the clean energy sector, Ethan felt inspired to make a bigger impact by addressing climate change, global resource constraints, animal welfare, and human health. A committed vegan, Ethan wondered if creating a perfect plant-based meat product could drastically reduce the staggering amount of animal protein produced and consumed globally. Pursuing this idea, Ethan connected with Dr. Fu Hong She and Harold Huff at the University of, Minnesota, of Missouri. Excuse me. Uh, their collaboration, along with support from the University of Maryland, Kleiner Perkins Caulfield and Byers, and the Obvious Corporation, led to the creation of Beyond Meat in 2009. The company has also gained support from Morgan Creek Capital, the Humane Society of the United States, Closed Loop Capital, and most recently, Bill Gates. By all accounts, Ethan Brown's Beyond Meat has had a meteoric rise. Beyond Meat's plant-based meat is replacing animal-based products meal by meal with influential tastemakers from Bill Gates to New York Times columnist Mark Bittman singing its praises. As Bittman said, fooled me badly in a blind tasting. And I'm very glad to say that we will be enjoying the delicious result of Ethan Brown's creativity and innovation uh, as part of our lunch today. So please join me in welcoming Ethan Brown. Thank you very much, Kelsey. Appreciate it. Uh, it's very humbling to be here, and um, it's a really special event for me because I, I get the opportunity to speak um, uh, often, and and um, you know this is probably one of the harder talks that that I'll have to give because you guys feel so much uh, the way I do about the things that I'm about to talk about, and so I have to make sure I'm not preaching to the converted because there's a uh, you know, this is my passion, and this is why I, I did uh, what I what I did, and why I continue to do what I'm doing. Um, I can also safely say that uh, uh, you know I'm a big fan of the of, of um, the Animal uh, Legal Defense Fund, and it's probably the only group of lawyers I accept an invitation from on a Saturday to come <laughs> come visit, and that's really true. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I should uh, I should also note that my brother and uh, and my sister are both attorneys. I somehow escaped, and um, uh, <laughs> but. Uh, but they work at, my sister works at NRDC, and, and my brother works for a rainforest uh, uh, coalition. And, and, and even, you know, there's a, there's a whole dialogue going on about NRDC and, and how they, they, they view animals and things like that. So it's a fascinating time in, in this movement and, and in, in what we're doing. Um, but I want to talk a little about Beyond Meat and, and again, just express my appreciation for being here. Uh, so wh why do this? And, and, and everyone in this room, I, I heard there's a very uh, impactful speech just given, and uh, so, so I think that there's, there's, there's a very obvious answer to that. But there's some broader answers as well that, that I like to stress when, when talking to folks. And I really look at it as, as, as four different, different reasons. And for me, it's fascinating that by changing out three or four ounces at the center of the plate, uh, you can impact each of these areas. And I think one of the reasons that we've gotten the investment support that we have uh, is there very few things in life that you can say, listen, if I can do this one thing, I can impact four really significant problems that are impacting people and the environment negatively every day. And I'll go through these, uh, you know, three out of the 10 top uh, um, mortality drivers in the United States, whether it's heart disease, diabetes, or cancer, you know, there are these direct correlations to, to, uh, to animal protein consumption. And actually, USC did a, a really nice study. Has anyone, anyone seen that, where, where they did a really sensational headline? It was around, um, I think it was something like consuming processed meat as bad as smoking or something to that nature, and it was out of the, the health uh, group here. But th every day you kind of see more and more headlines, and, and while that might be a little bit extreme, uh, this point is getting out uh, that there is this, this correlation. 
and it's not new, and, and people always say, you know, why is this happening now? And, and I, that I, I always go back to that uh, quote by Victor Hugo that there's, there's, no, um, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. You know, it, it, when I was growing up, the, the book that my parents had on the shelf, although I never saw them read it, was, uh, was, was Dr. Spock's about childcare, right? And if you open that book, which is, you know, written many times over many different decades, he continued to revise it. But uh, in, the, in the, uh, the edition that we had, um, you know, there's a, uh, a sentence that says, the best diet for children is vegetarian. You know, of course, that was my, my parents, were, uh, my dad's an academic, my mom's, uh, uh, you know, an editor. Um, <coughs> so there was no reason to ignore that, but they did, you know? <laughs> and so it was meatloaf and burgers for us, for sure. And, uh, and so that idea has been there for a very long time. And then you look at, um, you know, things like uh, Diet for Small Planets, written in 1971. So these are not new ideas. It just takes a very long time for them to become mainstream. And I think we're, as a culture, experiencing that, that happening. Um, this is a really important number to me uh, because it's very controversial. Um, I had an opportunity when I was in school to uh, meet a guy named Robert Goodland, who was a um, was a chief environmental officer at the at the uh, World Bank at the at the time, and he's this really imposing. Um, he was he passed away unfortunately about two years ago, but uh, imposing and authoritative uh, presence. And he came to my house to to, to when I was uh, living with my parents to give a talk um, in something called that my dad had called the Green Ribbon Society. And it was a, a, a reference to John Locke and, and, and some of the kind of underground political movement that was going on in, in, uh, in England at the time. But, but the, 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 the speech that he gave had nothing to do with this number, but I, I, I was just so impressed with the guy that I kind of continued to follow what he was doing. And uh, he put together with a guy named Jeff Anang uh, a study on the impact of animal livestock on climate. And the end result of that was said that 51% of greenhouse gas emissions can be attributed to livestock. And it was trashed by, uh, by, by vested interests and, and even by the UN by saying, look, it can't be that much, et cetera. But I've seen no um, credible uh, deconstruction of, of the analysis that he's done. And, and so whether it's 30% or 51% doesn't, doesn't too much matter. The point is that it's a huge contributor to, to greenhouse gas. So the, you know, in, in terms of what you can do, uh, it's not necessarily the lights in your house, the car, et cetera, that are the determining factor. Those all contribute. But it's those three or four ounces at the center of the plate that make the most difference. And, and so the more that message can get out, uh, I think the, the, the better opportunity we have to solve the, the climate problem. And one of the sort of catch-22 or got-me uh, moments of the, uh, of the study is, is he talks about the fact that there's an unnatural number of animals on the Earth's surface due to, to animal agriculture. And you know what? All those animals are breathing. And uh, you know, I'm a fan of innovation in science, and, and you, can, you can do a lot to make uh, certain processes more efficient, but you can't invent an animal that doesn't breathe. <laughs> and so you know, uh, we're, we're probably doing the closest thing to that, um, along with some of the colleagues we have who are doing in vitro, in vitro meat. But it's, it's a basic issue, right? So that every time they breathe, they're respiring carbon. Carbon is loading the atmosphere and making it warmer. So it's, it's, it's just a mathematical problem. Um, 80% of the world's agricultural land is used in, in, in livestock, uh, 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 either production of feed or directly, um, primarily production of feed. So uh, from an agricultural perspective, you know, replacing those three or four ounces at the center of the plate could create a whole other second or third agricultural revolution uh, in the United States um, and would well, uh, be well worth doing for, for, for farmers. Uh, it, would, it would bring them more money uh, per field. And so we talk about shifting from, uh, from fields of pasture to fields of protein. Uh, and then lastly, this is the number that I think most people in this room are, 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 are focused on often, and that's the 66 billion animals that are slaughtered every year uh, when they probably don't need to be. Uh, the problem is it's going the wrong way, right? I mean, that, that's, that's the issue is as, as the world is gaining affluence, um, you continue to see uh, people expressing a preference for animal protein, and you see the shift from animal protein toward animal protein uh, and away from grains. And, uh, and so, so it's an, there's an urgency to this that, that we need to acknowledge. And, and later in the presentation, I'll talk about it. We use the name, uh, the Manhattan Beach Project, for our, our scientific group, one, because it's near Manhattan Beach, but, but two, uh, because we wanted to um, uh, instill in them, one, a sense that we're trying to bring the smartest scientists we can find to this problem, uh, like they did uh, in University of Chicago during the Second World War to, to create the atomic bomb. And two, uh, there's a sense of urgency about this. It's not something that we can kind of get to when we get to. It's, it's the earth is truly in the balance on this question. Um, 
the good news is there's kind of two different ways you can think about this problem. And I, I saw this a long time ago in business school, um, and I, I've always uh, been interested in it. Um, so how many people have seen this before? <laughs> okay, see, I'm preaching to the inverted. Should we just go right to questions? <laughs> that is terrible. That is absolutely awful. All right. Anyway, so it's an old lady and a young lady. So, um, okay. It's just, you guys are super educated. <laughs> smart, like. <laughs> Shoot. All right. Um, so, uh, all right. So, so, but the point here is that you can think about meat in two ways. You can think about it about where it's from, right? And, that, that, and then you get sort of stuck. It has to come from a, a cow, chicken, or pig, or, or whatever, whatever the, the animal you're consuming is. Uh, or you can think scientifically about what meat is. And if you think the second way, some really interesting things happen. And, and so meat is really five things. If you, if you just look at from a composition of matter perspective, what is meat? It's, it's, uh, it's amino acids, it's lipids, it's carbohydrates, it's minerals, and it's water. That's all meat is. So it's not some sort of magic. Uh, what the animal's doing is taking basically plant matter, and converting it, separating it, and then, and then uh, recon re reconfiguring it in the form of muscle, and the composition of that muscle is those five things. So if we can get those five things directly from plants and do what the animal does, which is to put them in a certain combination and put them in a certain texture, who's to say that's not meat? And, and I think if you can do that, then all of a sudden you say, okay, well, here's meat, and, and we didn't have to use an animal. And the, the, the world is full of things uh, where that's happened, and, and I'll talk about those later. Um, but why do we have so much trouble doing this uh, and thinking, thinking about uh, moving, moving away from animal protein? And, and for me, it really, I, I had to think a, a lot about this, and, and, and it really began, I think, about three million years ago when there was the, the early hominins, and then there was the chimpanzees, and the, the hominins sort of split into two groups. One was uh, slightly more carnivorous, the other was vegetarian. Uh, due to drastic changes in the climate, the vegetarian group, which had these massive jaws and, and, and were very robust, actually died out because they couldn't adapt to the changes uh, as, as quickly as, as the more carnivorous, because the carnivorous could move to different environments and, and consume uh, uh, fats and, and protein off of other animals. Um, and so, uh, that strain of, of Homo sapiens really grew, and it changed, and, and everything about us, I think, can be contributed to, to meat consumption in terms of how quickly we rose in, in, in uh, intellectual capabilities and everything else. So our brains went from about 600 cubic centimeters to 1,300 cubic centimeters over the course of, of about uh, 1.8 million years. And, you know, our ability to create um, uh, societies and cultures and everything, they, they could, the anthropologists would look back and say, okay, it was the organization for hunting that really led us to be able to coordinate with one another and, and, and uh, even the ability to become, uh, to stand up, to, to, to walk on two instead of four limbs, you know, freed up our arms and to, to create tools to, 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 to hunt. Um, so I don't think you can, I, I never have an interest in those arguments that, well, we were never meant to eat meat, et cetera. I, I, think, I, I think differently about it. Uh, I think we were meant to eat meat, and the question is, do we want to keep eating meat from animals, or do we want to create it ourselves? Because the reason we started to consume meat was around a nutrient-dense food. That's all we were looking for, right? Chimpanzees will chew up to 12 hours a day, right? We don't want to do that. We have other things, particularly now, like our iPhones, stuff like that, <laughs> that you want to play with. And so, uh, so by, by, allow, by freeing up all this time, uh, we were able to, to do a lot of different interesting things. So to me, I said, said okay, well, if I'm going to go about the trouble of recreating meat directly from plants, I want to create a more nutrient-dense form of meat so that we can continue the process of evolution. And, th and that's really, really what, what some of our, our new products uh, are doing. But it's this, this, this ingrained, you know, and even if you look at the structure of your teeth, uh, uh, sense within us that, that animal protein is something that, that, that we should be consuming. Um, and, and what's so interesting is we made that ethical choice when we had no ability to do so. Right? We made that ethical choice when our brains were 600 cubic centimeters. They're now 1,300. So you know, between that, that growth and gray matter, uh, a lot of us started to say, well, wait, this may not be right. You know, there there may, may be something wrong with this. And, and I think, for me, the person that most powerfully articulated that, although not within the context of what we're talking about today, uh, was Charles Darwin. And, and you know, Darwin really made this the key observation and the one that was so difficult. He didn't publish The Origin of Species for 20 years because uh, he was so uh, concerned about uh, what the Church of England would do. Um, but, but when he did, um, it was a blessing, um, because it, it really talked about the fact there are no stark differences between species. There's no stark difference between us and, 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 and the lower animals. And again, preaching the inverted, but to me that made a big impression, uh, saying uh, that you know, all, all these efforts to create a, a separate human being that is distinct from, from, uh, from animals, uh, scientifically isn't right. 
and, and so then that, 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 that decision we made when our brains were less than half the size they are today needs to be re-examined, right? And, and that's what so many of you in this room are doing. And so I like to think about the Lamb's Bible. And who's seen the movie Medea, the, the, like Medea goes to prison, the Ed, Eddie Murphy thing? Okay, again, it's educated group, only two people have seen it. It's a funny movie, okay? It's a really funny movie. But anyway, like I always think back to his character, and he'd be like, you know, when the lamb, like putting lamb's blood on everyone's door, like you're going to do what with my blood? You know, like if the lamb wrote the Bible, the Bible would be a very different thing, <laughs> right? But the lamb didn't write the Bible, you know, we did, right? And, and coincidentally, we're the stars of it, right? And everything's, you know, everything's for our disposal, and, and, and it's, it's our dominion and, and, and everything else. Uh, but from a kind of philosophical perspective, if you look at like John Rawls or something like that, where they talk about you know a position of ignorance and, and, and designing society in a way that you don't know where you're going to be in it, you know no one would ever design a, a society uh, like the, the Bible uh, if there were other perspectives. It's so clearly anthropocentric, and and so our ability to take the additional gray matter that we had and make the right decisions about how we treat the rest of the world all of a sudden became very confusing, particularly around 2,000 years ago when this, this image that we were somehow direct image of God and, and able to, uh, to treat others um, as if they were there for our disposal uh, took hold and, and basically uh, uh, became something that was, was widely accepted throughout the world. So um, this, this notion of trying to think differently about animals with regard to, to how we use them one, we have ev evolutionary bias toward consuming them, and two, we have a religious structure that suggests that we don't need to think differently about them. Uh, for me, those are two. So those are two really strong headwinds that you have to deal with, and you know you can make philosophical arguments, you can debate, and I think that's what you know a lot of um, uh, uh, people need to be doing. It's important to create new frameworks and not live the, out the old ones that, that are out there, um, but. Uh, for me, I said, well, let's try to do this through innovation. Let's just try to obviate the problem. Like, let, let's, just, let's just try to make it go away, naively is my, my thought, uh, by providing an alternative. And so I looked at things like what Henry Ford did with, with the horse-drawn carriage. Like, he didn't rail against the horse-drawn carriage. He wasn't like, that thing's terrible, you know, you know like, look, look at what a mess it's making, it's destroying the world. He just said, like, here's a new car, it's better, do you want it, you know? And, and, and so, and so th that, to me, that's the great thing about uh, innovation, the great thing about the United States and other countries that allow for a culture of innovation is that you can provide alternatives that are simply better. Uh, so even if you can't get alignment on the, the uh, ethical reasons for doing something, by providing an alternative that's better, you can create change. So how, like the, the other day, my son was petitioning, he's 10, he was petitioning for a, a, a phone. And he kept asking me day after day. So finally, I, I, I caved and I said, fine. I, I, jokingly, I said, you can have a landline. I'll get you a landline. <laughs> so, like, so you know what he said to me? He said, what's that, right? <laughs> and so, you know, it, it's not like you go around arguing like, well, you know, I, I'll, I, the Meatless Mondays, why well, I have the trouble with Meatless Mondays, like, it's like, you know, it's not like you use your iPhone on Mondays and then you go back to the landline six days a week. It's like the, 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 the iPhone destroyed the landline or the, the, cord, the, the, uh, the uh, mobile phone destroyed the landline. You know, I, I want to introduce products and create products that uh, people don't talk about having them on Monday and then thankfully going back to, to meet on, on Tuesday. They just stop using animal protein because the products are so much better. And, and that's what happened with the mobile phone. That's what happened with the automobile. That's what happened with, um, you know, the electric versus kerosene lamp. Um, so there are plenty of, of, of ways to do this. Um, and that's why I, I chose and, and, and feel so passionate about trying to innovate our way out of this problem. So how do you do that? This is, I, I love this. This is pretty neat. So it takes a uh, broiler like six or seven weeks. It's a horrible life. Um, you know, uh, uh, and just the statistics on how many actually aren't properly uh, 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 um, slaughtered is, 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 is alarming, which I think maybe some of the stuff you guys are just talking about. Uh, but anyway, um, it takes one to two minutes to do our process. So people always say, oh, your food is processed. You know, how can you, you know, how can you get my kids, why do you want my kids to eat this processed food? And I say, it's a tale of two processes, right? So which one do you want? Because they're both processes, right? <laughs> and and uh, we offer it, and we still do. Anyone who wants to come to our facility at any time can do so. They don't have to make an appointment. They can come, they can look, they can walk the floor with us. I, and we say, Purdue, Tyson, can you guys do the same? And they can't, and they shouldn't, because it's not a process people want to see, right? And so. We, are, we do run through a process, which I'll explain, but it's a very simple process compared to the, the process that, that animals uh, uh, go through. Uh, 
um, and it's basically heating, cooling, and pressure. So we're taking protein from the plant, and we're applying heating, cooling, and pressure in a varied sequence that essentially takes, and this is not the right scientific description, but it, uh, it, 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 I think it makes it clear, takes a set of disorganized proteins, and it organizes them in a way that is akin to how they'd be organized in animal muscle. So when you bite into it, you, you're, you're biting into some of those striations and that structure that you do, that you've been doing, and your ancestors have been doing for two million years, so it's familiar to you. And for me, that was very important to get the, the texture right. Uh, and I think our texture is actually better than our taste. Um, and so we're still, still working on the latter. But, uh, but that's, so, so we came back to this process, like, look, if you know what meat is, you know it's five things, and you know the structure of it. And by the way, we, put, we, put, we do weird things, like we put, put uh, chicken breast under MRIs like you would for your knee. Uh, and we look at the, the structure of it, and we say, okay, we need to make sure that, that the proteins are aligning like this, that there's a distribution of fat like that. And so we, we understand uh, the, right, the, right, uh, the right format. Uh, but that's what it is. It's heating, cooling, and pressure. So if you're willing to eat pasta, for example, which goes through a very similar process, you should be willing to eat our food. So who's doing this? I should have edited this because there's no one from USC on this, but uh, <laughs> that's okay. Um, so what I think is so cool about what's going on is, is when, when I first started the company, uh, which was in early 2009, I think in 2010, I went and I met with one of the largest food companies in, in the world. They were interested in the, the technology and the platform, and I went to their headquarters and, and, and visited with them, and, and uh, I asked how many people are working on um, plant-based protein, and they have a brand. They have a brand that probably all of you have consumed, and they said, well, it's one half of, of, of one full-time person, and so I said, wow, that's really nothing, and you're not going to change the world with you know, thinking about it as an afterthought that's there for the vegetarian daughter who's become vegetarian for six months and then decides to start becoming carnivorous again. You know, you, you're not going to make the impact you want to make if you think about it that way. So we created this Manhattan Beach Project, which brought together what I think are some of the brightest scientists in the world uh, to, to, try to, to try to recreate meat directly from plant. And we have two main projects going on. One is a raw beef that we're working on, uh, and two is, uh, is improving the, the, the taste and texture of our chicken. That's what we call it, Chicken 2.0, and, and it's, uh, it's um, the both of them are moving forward. I, say, I think there's a, a bigger priority on beef right now just because of the market uh, size, and, and uh, we're just really excited about the, the product that we have. It's, 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 it's coming along. It'll be released next year. Um, but the goals are pretty straightforward. That's one of the things I also love about this, this, this part of our work is it's not like shifting targets. It's, it's like, you know, you know exactly what a burger uh, uh, tastes like, feels like, looks like, smells like, uh, what's in it. Uh, same with chicken. And these guys are tasked with using all their scientific knowledge, which is interesting because it's so diverse. Like it's, you have your uh, biochemists, you have uh, structural protein specialists, um, structural biologists, et cetera. And they're bringing together all these skill sets to, to go ahead and recreate, uh, recreate the, the, uh, the animal muscle, basically, from plants. So these are some of the prototypes. Um, you know, my, my dream is that you'll be seeing those flipped in McDonald's within five years. Uh, that, that's, that's my hope. Um, and so the second part of doing all this, I think, is around the brand. So you have the science and you got the brand. And um, did a couple things uh, that... that um, you know, and the good thing about these talks is you're allowed to talk about the good things that you do, and you can just act like you never made any mistakes. Like, I've made a huge number of mistakes in building this company, but, but thankfully I don't have to tell you guys that. <laughs> I have a board of directors that's, that knows all the, the skeletons. But uh, on the brand, um, we really wanted to create excitement around this. And so, so uh, we, we worked very hard to, to uh, influence media, to, 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 to be with media, to... to, to uh, to um, try to set the agenda um, in, in terms of uh, how these products are uh, conveyed to people. And, and um, uh, about a year ago, we hired um, a guy named Jeff Manning, uh, who was the architect of the Got Milk campaign, because I, I both loved and hated the Got Milk campaign. <laughs> you know, like walking into any gym in America, any like I was at the, a middle school uh, a couple years ago in, in um, a place called Brooklyn, Maine. And I walk into the gym, and there's Derek Jeter with a milk mustache, Taylor Swift, et cetera. And to me, I said, it's incredible that one protein can, can, can directly market to children. And I said, so that's not fair. But look, if it's not fair, I want to be that protein. You know? And so, so uh, I've said, well, I'll, I'll find a guy who did it. Jeff Manning asked him to join us. He's, he's joined us, uh, and, and uh, he's been great. So we are part of what our marketing initiative is for 2015 is to, to create a Got Milk campaign around plant protein. To, to communicate the message of this, the, the message that Dr. Spock 
had already identified and many others, you know, 40, 40 years ago, that this is the healthiest thing you can be feeding your kids. Um, and so uh, you, you're going to see a lot of that campaign coming out. Um, and if something's resonating about it, so this is, this is an article on our Beast Burger, and, and it was the most shared uh, article in the history of Outside Magazine. And so I just found that interesting that, so here's a group, it's, it's, it's not targeting um, vegans or vegetarians, uh, but the concept that you can create a, a more nutrient-dense source of food, again, you harken back to why to become carnivorous in the first place. So what we did with that is we said, okay, we're going to take a, a burger, we're going to make sure there's as much protein in it as raw beef, uh, as much iron, but we're also going to add omegas and antioxidants and calcium and, and, and uh, all, all the vitamin B set and, uh, and a muscle recovery blend. And, and then we're going to have athletes uh, go out there and talk about it. So David Wright of the New York Mets uh, is a spokesman for us. We're about to sign um, J.J. Redick here at the Clippers and many others um, to, to go out there and talk about why they use a plant-based meat to refuel. Right? And, and so it just gets outside of that whole, let's make sure we take care of the, the one vegetarian child who's going to switch back pretty soon. And I really am trying hard to create this experience for people where it's just a cooler, neater thing to do, right? And, and uh, so, so you don't you know, have people I, I, you know, walking around uh, 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 championing for the landline. You no longer will have people championing, hopefully, for meat if there's something out there that's better. Um, so this was a, 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 uh, a sampling that, that we did uh, live. I, they didn't tell us they were going to do this, so we just turned, to, we, we knew they were going to be on there, but we didn't know that they were actually going to be sampling the product, and so I'll just show you this real quick, um, and, and then uh, I'll open up some questions. Uh, how do I switch? We're back, meat substitutes. Healthier. They also point out with the soaring cost of meat at four at five forty nine a bag now, five forty nine for a twelve ounce bag of this stuff. It's almost cheaper than chicken. Critics say while all of that may be true, it is still actually a processed food. Okay. Right? No, taste test. Let's start with the chicken salad. Chicken salad. Chicken, chicken, salad. chicken salad's okay. up top. So you taste both of those. Um, make sure you get a piece of the chicken. Okay. okay. Wow. It takes you guys forever to. Yep. Jesus, I, I, not I, 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 <laughs> All right, ready? Okay. So, yeah. which one is real, Matt Lauer? Which one's fake? This is real chicken. That's fake chicken. This is real chicken. That's real. Real. Fake. Yeah, real on the right. All right. Real on the how right. About, how about real is on the left? No. Oh, really? Real is on the left. Wow. Wow. The real wow. meat that new. Chicken is on the right. right. Interesting. There you go. That's Carson, you got it wrong. Yeah, oh, it's great. Though. You are. Okay. I guess you are a loser after all. I certainly am. I've been waiting to say that. Let's go on to beef. Let's go on to beef. Let's go on to beef. Wow, that's crazy. You guys are quite, it's like being at my house. You guys are pretty close. You're not supposed to talk with your mouth full. No, you're not. <laughs> hmm. And the company also says tell, that right? they're uh, real on the right again. I, I got mostly real vegetables the right. there. Real is on the right again? I no, this is, a, this is the, the, the right. beef crumble thing. Real is on the left. Wow. What? I got it wrong. Again, I got the, it wrong? The, real, the real beef is on the left. Yeah. The beyond beef is on the right. The company is also coming out with hamburgers uh, this summer, so you won't be. I said just, like, I think the taste and texture are king. I think the thing that we've gotten, again, is the texture and the taste we still need to work on. And, and taste is interesting because you can get it from amino acids and things. And, and we're trying to move away from these kind of um, uh, chicken stock type things that flavor companies will give you and more to actually trying to find exactly what is in a chicken breast that gives you that sort of sensory experience of consuming it. Um, core platforms, so we have the Beyond Chicken, uh, Beyond Beef, um, Reasons, you know, th these are things that you guys are aware of. Um, but uh, this is the one one new product that, that actually uh, we're, we're just launching now. We we we, we put it out um, on the market uh, at, at Whole Foods, um, and we're, uh, we're we're actually getting ready now to, to go into Safeway and to Sprouts. And uh, the idea here is again to provide all the benefits of, of of consuming, let's say, raw beef, but then create a whole new animal by putting omegas in there by. Uh, by uh, loading up on antioxidants, calcium, potassium, all the things your body needs to, to stay, to stay uh, um, satiated and, and, and healthy. Uh, and so the idea is if it's side by side, tastes good, gives you more, would you go for this as a nutrient-dense uh, meat? And I love the thing about the, I like Henry Ford a lot, and, and, and one of the quotes that he has is, you know, if I asked people what they want, they would have told me faster horses. You know, <laughs> and it's like, so particularly this ground beef, like if we went out and asked the average consumer, 
we do a lot of tests. We do tests with major fast food groups and, and things like that. Uh, they would tell you they want a veggie burger, honest to God. They'd be like, you know, a, a hardcore carnivore that eats at, let's say, McDonald's or Burger King. You do a focus group with them. They say, we don't want something that's made from plants that acts just like meat. We actually want a veggie burger because we can recognize it. We know what it is. But I'm convinced that if you show them something that is actually truly plant-based meat, that is, that's what our workings are in our raw beef product, that they'll change their mind. And I think it's just too hard sometimes for people to see that. And, and so, you know, we're not backing away from that. But we do know that, that there's a, um, you know, we have, we have a, a, a steep, steep uh, hill to climb. Uh, so we've rolled out a lot of new products this year. Um, these are in, uh, most of these are in, in Whole Foods, depends on what region. Um, but again, the idea here is to try to make it simple for families uh, and, and have it be a staple in the family uh, 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 freezer. Um, we've been very blessed to have uh, some really interesting people work uh, with us. Um, Biz Stone and Evan Williams, uh, who are, and these guys have obviously funded uh, the company, but, but uh, so I would be obligated to say nice things about them, but they are incredible people. Uh, I mean, they're just, they're just uh, it's, it's a, as I said, it was humbling to be here. It's extremely humbling to be, to be uh, in the company of, of these visionaries. I mean, they're, they're just, they're, they're not only incredible uh, um, kind of disruptors, but they're also very good human beings. Uh, so I'll tell a very brief story and I'll wrap up. When, when I met with Bill Gates, uh, the, the, the people that facilitated the, the meeting kind of had me real nervous uh, about it. They said, he's going to find a, a, a mathematical equation in your presentation, and he's going to make you do it on the spot. And you, you know, and you got to make sure everything in there is right. So I was nervous about that because we have a lot. We had a lot of different you know, things about cost and, and, and et cetera. And uh, I didn't wear a suit. And, and uh, as, I, as I got there, three people were leaving uh, the meeting room that we were in, and they were in suits, and they looked kind of rumpled, and they were leaving. And I thought, wow, <laughs> this is really not good. I go in, and, and he was like the nicest guy in the world. He like wanted to talk about his kids and love the food. He kept asking, is this a mix of animal protein and plant protein? He kept sort of trying to say, like, you know, how do you make this? He got really interested in it. And so I had another opportunity to sit down with him. He's just a very genuine, nice person. So, so it was a, a, a blessing. But uh, Seth Goldman is, a, is, a, is, a, is also on the board. He's the founder of Honest Tea. Great, great guy. Um, uh, so just have a, a real opportunity to work with some, some fascinating people. And I think that's also part of this, you know, why is this happening now? There's a lot of reasons it's happening now, but when folks like that are interested in seeing this, it's, a, it's incredible. Uh, it wasn't the case, uh, you know, uh, 20 years ago. So 25 by 20, this is what I'll close with. It's, uh, you know, I got a lot of flack for this, but I, I still uh, think it's the right thing to do. Um, the vision is if you can re reduce animal protein consumption 25% globally by 2020, which is impossible, uh, you could solve uh, all of the um, uh, Kyoto climate targets. You could, you could address all of them uh, just by that one measure. So it's obviously not going to happen, but if it did, you could, you could do that, right? And so that's amazing to me that that doesn't require any new fueling stations. You know, it doesn't require any... Uh, uh, you know, lithium ion batteries, uh, it requires a change of those three or four ounces of the center plate to change the world, to save the world. And uh, so to me, that was, that was compelling. Anyway, that's it. The question for you is finding plant sources that are not GMOs. Are mm -hmm. you having any success with that since if you're going to try and get people to convert, mm -hmm. we're going to have to get rid of a lot of the GMO things, and it takes a long time to convert that land back after it's been contaminated. So yeah. how yeah. do we address that? Yeah, no, it's a great, great question. And, and I know Bill Gates is for GMOs. So. Sure, sure. Um, so, no, it's a great question. Uh, and we – there's a couple things that I pay attention to uh, whether I agree with them or not. And, and so um, – for example, carrageenan. People got all over stuff putting carrageenan in some of our products. And, you know, I, I, I consume, like, silk soy milk by the bucket. I love this stuff. It's got carrageenan in it. You know, I, eat, I had three beef burgers yesterday. It's got carrageenan. So there's certain things from a science perspective I look at and say, that makes sense. It's fine. But you still have to listen. So we are probably taking that product, taking that ingredient out of our products. Um, but GMO is a similar issue. So, so we're we, we uh, soy obviously has that issue, right? And we use non-GMO soybeans. Uh, pea protein less so, right? So a lot of our proteins come from peas. 
um, we're doing a lot of discovery work around proteins. There's a fascinating number of proteins that, that are out there. I think, um, you know, it, numbers in the thousands, that, uh, like lupin, camelina, mustard seed, all those have great sources of protein. Tobacco leaves have great sources of protein. So there's tons of different products you can pick from. You just have to set that screen. Okay, non-GMO is one of those screening items that we're going to adhere to. So we're not going to be using GMO products. The other source of protein, which is fascinating, is yeast. Yeast is an awesome source of protein. Th its amino acid profile is, is, is higher than, than, than meat, than beef, than beef. Um, by like, I don't know, it's like 138 to 100 or something like that. Um, and you know what they're doing at breweries is throwing out yeast, you know. So that's pretty cool. You know? <laughs> in fact, so we make, we make some of our burgers out of yeast and they, they taste a little like beer sometimes. I'm not kidding. <laughs> it's really neat. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you have run into any trouble or anticipate any trouble with um, FDA and labeling and using yeah. words like uh, beef or chicken like prominently on the label of these products. <laughs> yeah, we have for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you went to our Facebook page, but I won't get into here that much. But 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 we did with the Beast Burger, so we 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 have we have a labeling change we're making. Yeah, they're they're all over us for that for sure. And so it's, so it's again, it's like it's back to like what's true and then what's what sort of regulatory issue. And so we do have more uh, protein and iron than raw beef, for example. But the way that it was stated on the package, uh, uh, sort of regulatory, was 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 uh, a challenge. So. What have you heard of the lab-grown beef that occurred in about 2013? I think yeah. it was in England. Yeah. And they used the cow muscle. And yeah. And so so I, I, um, back in the mid-2000s, I sat down with a guy named Jason Matheny. Does anyone know who that is? Yeah, yeah great guy. And, uh, and I thought about, like, could, could sh I really wanted to do this, what I, what I was doing. And I really wanted to create a plant-based McDonald's. Like, that was my, my, my goal. And, uh, and so I was looking at um, different ways to, to do something like that. And I looked a lot at, at plant-based, at, at, uh, lab-grown, uh, in vitro, uh, meat, and, uh, talked to some of the scientists doing it, and, and I think it's an awesome technology. I think it's, it's neat and, and everything else. I, I decided not to pursue it for two reasons. One is I'd come out of the fuel cell industry, and there's a saying in the fuel cell industry that fuel cells are good for the future, and they always will be, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I didn't want another project like that, <laughs> you know, um, and I feel that that, that in vitro meat is still really far away. And so that was the first thing. The second is, I think there is a real issue, a hurdle with consumers around getting them to consume that. A hurdle for consumers, even though it's irrational, to, to, con to consume that. Yeah. And, and, and consumer behavior on this question is, is odd, right? It's, it's Jason, I can remember him telling me a story where he was in a discussion with um, someone at Purdue or something like that. Not, not Purdue, but, but a large company like that. And uh, they were talking, he was talking about, well, why don't you make, um, why don't you basically essentially create chickens that are, you know, and this is a uh, that, that are uh, um, basically retarded, right? So they can't have any conception of what's going on, right? And, and so that would be more humane. So, well, people would never want to eat retarded chickens. So it's like there's just a strange, but that would be more humane for them, right, to, to not have any mental cap capabilities, right? So people are just strange about what they want to eat. So they, they, for some reason, people are more comfortable eating chickens that suffer than, than ones that don't, but anyway. So you mentioned Safeway and Sprouts, and it seems to me you'd make a lot more money on the retail side. But it, but it, I think you could probably change people's minds more easily on the restaurant consumer right. side. Right. So are you? What are you guys doing on that front? Right. Um, we are, we do a lot on that, and it's um, it's a very risk adverse culture. Uh, it's slow. Um, it's hard. It's just hard. And we we've worked. We've been running at that for a long time. Um, and we, we, we have an announcement that, that I hope to be making this year that is a major QSR, uh, quick serve restaurant. Um, but it's extremely risk adverse culture. That's the issue. Yeah. And it's, it's some of these things I mentioned where like they come back and say, well, we really want a veggie burger. That's through those experiences. We've gone to the front line with them to talk to their consumers. And that's the kind of feedback you get. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. have lunch now. It is in the hallway, the other end of the hallway in the cafe. And um, I know there were some questions, just so everyone's aware, everything we're serving here today is vegan. Um, even if it doesn't look like it is, it is. We have Beyond Meat today at lunch. So 
please enjoy. Um, we have the cafe. You can, you're welcome to go upstairs and take some fresh air. We also have an overflow room, room seven down the hall. Thanks so much. We're back here at 1. Back here at 1 p.m.